we reach the point where you're on board the ship now, the Cuba. Okay. You're on the Cuba. On All the Cuba, right. right? And you are experiencing your first time on the deck. So when the pit, the, the ship's pilot left the ship, we observed that there was a U.S. destroyer waiting for us just outside the harbor. Very true. Mm-hmm. This is Kingston Harbor. Oh my! The destroyer, fitted with depth charges, was to be our protector and guide all the way to our destination. So you had the U-boats to contend with, right? Wrapped snugly in our blankets on deck, I awoke to shouts in an unknown language. I raised my head to see men scurrying with their blankets and water pouring onto the deck from a hose held by a huge French sailor, because it was French, the language which we heard. And two other sailors scrubbed the deck with brushes. I nudged Alfred, who was still asleep, and we hurriedly took our blankets and got out of the way. This was to be the ritual, and it's a great amusement as men half asleep were seen running with wet blankets to escape these soldiers as they scrubbed the deck. <coughs> so, <coughs> one man came to you and asked you if there was a drill, because every day you had to have a, boat, a lifeboat drill, or a, a, a life protection, a life uh, jacket drill. And this man came up and said, what happened? He said, are we sinking? And he said, no. Where's your life jacket? You're supposed to have your life jacket. And then the man finally calmed down after you explained him what he had to do. So now, Alfred had gone before in 1943, and he talks about the David C. Shanks, the Shanks, which was one of the first ships that they brought the people over to, uh, to America in 1943 says the first batch in 1943 sailed on two overcrowded ships to the port of New Orleans when on the notorious shanks owing to the overcrowding and disorderly conditions one man went off his head and jumped overboard to his death mm -hmm. these two vessels became known as the death ships my friend Alfred was among that first batch aboard the shanks he recalled how there was a never-ending line, dinner called after supper, and recalled of men who, desperate to relieve bodily functions, eased themselves in wash basins instead of toilet bowls. The desperate demand to get the Jamaican farm workers to reap the American crops, and the savage U-boat attacks against shipping in the Atlantic led to the packing of the ships and the shorter course of the ships into the Gulf of Mexico. Ironically, the other ship that went with the Shanks was less crowded and could well have taken more men. Because of this blundering ineptitude, there was a great outcry in Jamaica. As a result, in the following year, the year you went in 1944, the transportation was well arranged and with good, and with good results. And now, well, by this time, the British and the U.S. navies were now much better prepared for the submarines. And you go on to describe how uh, that uh, research, benef you benefited from that research in anti-submarine warfare. Among the multitude of men on board, were mostly, mostly were, were seriously dedicated to their contract, but there were some who were taking advantage of it to find the El Dorado by skipping the contract and vanishing into the United States. That's what they planned to do. Some would marry into American society never to return. And there were some whose only intention was to roll the dice and to be a troublemaker. Move on. A variety of characters emerged from among the men on board the ship. One evening, a man mounted the deck on a box to preach his message. He stretched his hands out over the sea as if to command the Atlantic to still the terrors that abounded in the vast 
expanse beneath. God the King shall reign and come to judge this crooked earth, he thundered. Somebody in the crowd says, see you fool, see. You're not on the land, you're on the sea. The preacher stopped, looked at the direction from which the voice came, raised his hand and pointed at the unrepentant interpret, interrupter and said, you wicked sinner, your soul will burn in hell fire. But we weren't finished yet. The interrupter, reclining lazily amidship with his back against the deck and elbows hitched upon the rail, turned and sped over the side and then came back with this retort. I know you. You are the same Obaya man who was fooling those people at Mango Walk. What? You are the, you are the same Obaya man. Obaya. 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 You're the same Obaya man Obia. who fooled those people at Mango Walk. Obia. I know who you are. Obaya. Yeah, Obaya. Obaya. <laughs> you think I don't know you? Pandemonium broke loose. Men roared with laughter. The meeting was over. The preacher disappeared. Two hours later, I lay in my hammock. I heard music and singing. Singing. I went up to the deck to see Mr. Brown, a jovial taxi driver from Claremont whom I knew. His fat black face beaming with smiles, strumming on his guitar and singing to an appreciative audience, Donkey Want Water Hold Him Joe. The bouncing music was an open defiance to the German U-boats and to the preacher. Occupying a spacious cabin on the upper deck was a member of the crew. He was a large and serious looking and had the appearance of a Nordic blonde. What his position was, I did not know. He spake to no one. One morning, morning I saw him suddenly charge out of his cabin angrily chasing away three men sitting near his door. I thought it strange, as I could see no reason for his action, other than that he might not take well to black people, as I was too ready to assume. The next day I longed, I longed for something to read and observed that this man had in his cabin, easily seen through his door, a lot of magazines. I approached him at his door and asked if he could lend me a magazine to read. He immediately went and handed me two copies, quite courteously, further undermining my apparently misguided assumption <coughs> and further reinforcing that when it comes to judging human beings, we can apply the malaprop, never judge a book by its color. Among the crew were two Senegalese officers of which they were very black pigmentation of their skin was in contrast to the generally lighter toned Jamaicans. They always dressed in immaculate white uniforms. Each day, both these men, along with another member of the crew, paraded the deck and, and on some kind of inspection tour. Silently, they would pass by without a glance. So now, talks about the development of sonar and now you're now out in the Atlantic and you're passing Cape Hatteras, which was known as the graveyard of the Atlantic. And as you're traveling, you recall how the British developed ASDICs and the United States developed sonar, which was able, they able to detect submarines now. But even still, even with these developments, it was in need of prayer as you pass by. Then you go back and you're thinking as you're traveling, my retrospective mind of the events leading to my now being in America, because you're now on short for the ship, receded as the train pulled into the station of Batavia. So now you go back in time to discuss, you, go, you look forward and then you come back again in time so right now you had the trip on the ship, then you are on your trip to Elba. So let me read you something from that part there. 
Elba. Elba. And frankly, Elba. Elba. Elba, that's right, that's where you went. Let's just see, let's just check something here. Elba. Let me just read another part. Okay, let's 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 just go back a little bit here. This part I, I missed. I want to go back. Okay, so now you're you're arriving in America for the first time. And the title of that chapter is called, This Is It. Boys, this is it. New York City. New York City. This excited shout of someone running down the hatchway got me out of my hammock fast. You're on board the Cuba now. But this was not New York City, as we were to learn a few hours later. But the entrance to the Chesapeake Bay, Virginia. The shout that land had been sighted made little stir among the hundreds of men sleeping. Some just turned in their hammocks and went back to sleep, but not me. Along with a few others, we jumped out, wrapped in our blankets, and made for the upper deck. A cold blast of air hit us square like a block of ice. But despite this, we found the deck. And at 2 a.m., I saw America for the first time. There it was lights all along the coastline. To be at sea for the past four days was then to suddenly see this magnificent view was thrilling. I gripped the rails of the ship, two transfixed. The chilling wind was felt no more. My eyes kept riveted to the myriads of lights. I gave silent thanks with the realization that we were approaching a haven after anxious days in dangerous waters. So now you talk about how you say goodbye now to the troop ship. Suddenly our attention was drawn to our escort destroyer, now turning back to sea. She was passing on our port side, full speed ahead, so near that we could see the faces of the men in their naval uniforms. They lined the rails and as they sped past, they raised their caps in unison, waving heartily to us. We in turn waved back with thanks in our hearts. This was a thrilling moment of brotherly farewell. As our emotions welled up, I felt a salty taste in my mouth. It was tears running down my cheeks. There were other tears too, men beside me watching the destroyer pass by. They were unashamedly crying. The men aboard the destroyer serving to sacrifice themselves for our well-being we're now going back to sea without a break after seeing their charge safely into New York Harbor. Up to the time of entering the bay, we had no idea where we were. Men up on deck now for the first time since they had heard the excited shout of New York City, looked about them for the Statue of Liberty. Chattering voices kept asking, man, where is the statue? Isn't, it, isn't this New York Harbor? No, you fool, this isn't New York. Someone answered, but then where are we? By now, another launch had come along, another launch, another ship had come alongside. This was a government launch carrying official personnel. One of the men, a solidly built fellow leaning against the rail, said, what is this place? I went up to this gentleman and he said, Chesapeake Bay. <laughs> Chesapeake Bay. I repeated my, to myself, yes, Chesapeake Bay, the man rely, replied. I walked away feeling a bit silly, wondering what the man thought of my question. The surprised look in his face and my inquiry seemed to imply, what a funny guy, doesn't he know where he is? My embarrassment gave way to a comforting thought as it came to mind that this was war. Plans and destinations were the secret of a few. However, everyone going to America for the first time had visions of New York. 
But although our port of entry was a military secret for both farm workers and the Royal Air Force volunteers, we felt we could be bound for no other place but the New York City. All right? On our ship, as our ship edged toward the bay, one observed a battered trawler to port, a transport carrier laying off to, a, off to stern, a cruiser in our path about 300 yards away, to be followed by a ferry boat filled with passengers crossing our bow. A wonderful sight. The bay on this beautiful Sunday morning, the 4th of June, 1944, yeah may have been as beautiful that day in April 1607 when Captain Christopher Newport with his three storm-battered ships first anchored off the mouth of the bay. All seemed quiet, all at rest, the rising sun pouring its rays on God's handiwork. But this serenity was a camouflage hiding the machines of war, mending and healing broken and shattered hulls and bodies preparing to send 4,000s of men in mighty ships to crush the Nazi horde across the seas in Europe, or the Nipponese terror in the Pacific. The myriads of houses nestling in their niches circling the bay, with the gleaming reflection of the morning sun on their windows, were like shining eyes peering on the salubrious sea. So now, before you land, you're told everybody line up and strip for examination. Oh, not again was the outcry because you've been through all these different inspections. As all prepared for this merciless onslaught on our modesty on the deck of the ship, we had to undress. The United States was determined to land only the healthiest on its shores. We were to learn that there was a case of chicken box. And as because, and because of that, the whole crew had to be inspected again because of that one person. Someone started to sing, Onward Christian Soldiers. And the swell, the chant swelled as others joined as the sound of the, of the hymn seeped across the Chesapeake Bay. I now saw a launch approaching. Standing quite erect in the prow was a man neatly dressed in a brown suit. This man was easily recognized. He was Herbert MacDonald. Herbert MacDonald. And we have a picture of him. We have a picture of him. At the end of the book, I put a picture of him at the end of the book. We'll get to that, but I have a picture of Herbert Montana. Mm -hmm. Oh, the mm -hmm. Oh, I do that. Chief liaison officer for the West Indies in the United States. Herbert Montana. Mm -hmm. He was accompanied by George Scott, chief labor officer, and a man named Luzanne. Yes, right. Who had become your liaison officer in New York State. Oh, was a history. Mm -hmm. Well, you have it all here. And when you met him later on, after you came back, when you were married, you met him personally. The ship, now after the order to strip, and now you've finished being sprayed on board the ship, you're now, lead, you're now being tested for the final time, leaving the ship. Hundreds of bottomless men, because you're all naked, were being examined on the deck of the Cuba. Must have, must have presented a very dubious sight to anybody looking from the distance. What on earth is going on? But now you are in America, face to face with America. Hundreds of Jamaican faces peered down from the height of the Cuba onto the pier below, meeting the eyes of the dozens of American faces, both black and white. The men on the pier, busy making the docking of the ship complete, <clears throat> as we nonchalantly watch from the deck. Everyone ashore, the military police, the soldiers, everyone looks spick and span. I was so transfixed by the scene that I did not hear the call for dinner, our last meal on board. I felt a nudge in my side and a voice saying, come on, man, get your last feed, you'll need it. It was Alfred Barrett, 
Both of us, or both of us, went off to the dining room. We were extremely hungry. Alfred was a veteran of the first batch, and he knew the ropes. As we headed towards the dining room, he said, "When?" Do, when I said, I asked him, "When do you think we'll be off the ship?" He said, "I don't know, my boy." We docked at eleven o'clock, and it's long past midday, and those RAF are still on the ship. When it will be our turn, I don't know. Was his reply. There was a quiet that rested over the ship along the pier as the constant stream of men disembarked. I was now getting impatient as I longed to be ashore. Take it easy, Alfred said. Boy, take it easy. You've just got to continue in this queue. It will be an everlasting queuing until you return to Jamaica. I was to find Alfred's words true to, so true in the months ahead. On my passport was stamped Port of Entry, Norfolk, Virginia. So now you are being directed to a, to a, a, a table where an exchequer was handing out crisp $5 bills to each passing man. Every contracted farm worker from Jamaica and arriving in, in the United States was given gratuitously this amount as a little pocket money until the workers' first payday. As we felt the crisp texture of the bill, many remarked, the almighty dollar. <laughs> That's right. On returning to the room to collect my luggage, where we had deposited them in alphabetical order, I found pieces of my luggage were, were missing. I searched frantically as we were now aboard, the, about to head for the trains to take us on our northward journey. I saw two colored American workers who apparently had handled the luggage sitting in a corner and I approached them to inquire whether they had seen my lost bit of luggage. Their reply in their southern drawl I could not understand. What do you say? You lost your luggage? They kept smiling and sitting, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. In my desperation to find my luggage, I sought to find someone else to help. The only person nearby was a white military police officer. I approached him for help when all of a sudden, one of the colored workers with whom I had spoken to came smiling with my lost bit of luggage that he had found. This was my first encounter with the Southern Drawer. It never occurred to me at the time that perhaps the two luggage handlers found my Jamaican accent just as incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. It would be months later working with Ray, more on him to come, a colored man from the South who I worked with at Elba, that I reflected on the luggage incident. He had the same drawl, but by then I had become accustomed to his accent and had no difficulty in understanding him. Okay. Oh man. Mm. I'm living my life over. Over again. This was now the parting of the ways. Upon our arrival in Norfolk, we now learned of our ultimate destinations. By no particular reason that I could discern, I was detailed to board a train north to Batavia, New York. Just the name New York was exciting. Everyone wanted to go to New York, that is the city. The serendipity that was to follow me throughout had raised its head again, because without my, my eventual proximity to New York City, my story would have been very different. My thoughts ran to my uncle Jocelyn, my mother's brother, an uncle I'd only <laughs> known by name. Mm -hmm. And his picture is in the book, we have him in the book. He had left Jamaica years before I was born. My fantasy of meeting him, now so near, was thrilling. The immediate thought was how far away it was Batavia from New York City. The hundreds of men now off the Cuba, duly washed and fumigated, embarked on their trains for their disbursements over America, to Michigan, Nebraska, Kansas, Connecticut, and so they went on into the night. Our train rumbled on. I suddenly awoke and realized I dozed off. Most of the men were sleeping. From time to time, myriads of lights came into view and swiftly disappeared as we passed or skirted towns and cities. 
I thought to myself that only a few hours ago we were still at sea. Now here we are, our first experience, the United States on wheels. A gnawing feeling in my stomach reminded me of hunger. Simultaneously, I heard a voice saying, I'm hungry. I had boarded the train at 10 p.m. and it was now well past midnight and the last meal we had had was some 12 hours ago on the Cuba. Suddenly the train was slowing down. A sign came into sight, Richmond, Virginia. The train ground to a stop. There was a lot of hustle and bustle and a man came on board pushing a huge trolley. Alfred raised himself lazily from his sleep and said, those are lunch boxes, boys. So now finally going to get to eat. Then it was all aboard and the train takes off again. The lunch boxes were filled with a carton of milk, ham and cheese sandwiches, a small cake, apples and oranges. Despite my hunger and youthful appetite, I couldn't finish off at one go the contents of my lunch boxes, my lunch box. However, across the corridor from me was a man known to me as Simpson, who had seized, who had taken three lunch boxes to hide for himself, because he felt he wasn't going to have enough. And he took them and, and, and hid them away. But there weren't to be any fears about the food because there was plenty of food on the trip. In our compartment, were childhood friends, Alfred sitting beside me and others from my area, Ferdy Gruber, Lance Nelson, all together with me on this trip. Alfred, Ferdy, Fred, Alfred, Freddy, Lance and I were all on the same Boy Scout troop together. We had shared the same experiences the training of which was to be of inestimable value to us in what, we lay, in what lay ahead. Other men around us and in other coaches were strangers to us, recruited from parishes over Jamaica, but now joined together in one entity as part of the great conglomeration of allied forces in this great war to defeat the common enemy. My friends, Alfred, Ferdy and Lance, and I were lucky to stay together on the day we were processed at our recruiting center at Brownstown, we had all traveled together from our hometown of St. Anne's Bay. We kept together one behind the other straight through for the medical examination. And we got our registration numbers in the consecutive order. My ID was J14187, which is the button I showed you. There it is. I don't recall what the acronym, there's an acronym on the button, AFPD. We don't know what it means. I tried to look it up on the internet. I couldn't find the meaning. But this, this is, it, had, it was related to your identification. So now, hunger appeased. Let's see what happens next. Mm. Mm. See what happens next. Oh my mm -hmm. Our journey continued throughout the day, as did our walk back and forth to the dinner car for our evening meal. As we sped along, thank thankful that we had beaten the German blockade, the Jamaican buoyant spirits returned. My attention was diverted from the clackety clacking sound of the speeding train. I observed a homely scene of a mother and her little children hanging out the washing on the line. They stopped for a moment to gaze transfixed at the train, possibly fascinated by the black faces swiftly passing by. Then suddenly they started to wave excitedly. We waved back. We approached Washington. The dome of a beautiful building came into view. There goes the White House, was the cry from our lips. As we were to learn later, it was not the White House, but the Capitol building. The events that started during the 1930s were to change the face of the globe. Then you talk about Hitler's rise to power. And then you talk about the coronation of Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. 
1930, and he was seen by Jam many Jamaicans as the fulfillment of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian title for the emperor was the Rastafari. This title gave birth to the name Rastafarianism, inspired by the coronation of Haile Selassie. Rastafarianism was born in Jamaica in the 1930s. But during the Abyssinian War, that the, it was during the Abyssinian War that the Rastafarian cult became a prominent. <coughs> and then you go on to talk about the Frome riot in 1938. Oh, it was. Okay, Buster Sir William Grant. Sir William Sir Grant. Sir William Grant, that's right. And how they uh, began the labor movement in Jamaica. And then when Britain entered the war, Jamaica became automatically in war. 1939, September 1939. And then you describe the history of Jamaica leading up to the war. And then you go on to the uh, British forces that were trained in Jamaica in preparation to go to the Far East. The Jamaica Regiment was joined by the Fleet Air Arm stationed at Port Royal. And as the war expanded into the Pacific against Japan, Canadian forces were sent to Jamaica for training in, in tropical heat as conditioning for likely destinations in the Far East. Some of these forces were stationed at Manigue, and you often played them in soccer. I tried to find a picture of the team, but I couldn't find it. But you would play them. The games were competitive, but enjoyable. Terrible news came that the Canadian Winnipeg Grenadiers, who you had played against, were wiped out by the Japanese in the Battle of the Hong Kong in 1941. So you were part of that, and then they were, all the, the people you knew in that, they all were killed. The island also became a refuge for displaced persons from war-torn Europe. Hundreds of Spanish women and children from Gibraltar, the last British stronghold on the European continent, were transported across the Atlantic to Jamaica, away from fending danger of, fending danger of Nazi invasion. These people were offered the safety and responsibility of the Jamaican people at Mona Camp, where they were to remain to the end of the war. Then we describe how the land lease program came into effect and you describe how that led to the agreement between the British and the Americans for the war farm workers. So it started off with the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941. And you then discuss how many people went to war, how a major struggle it became. And then you talk about Sandy Gully, also known as Fort Simmons. And the Americans would call it Vernon Field, but you knew it as Sandy Gully. Being 30 miles west of Kington, it became a... This yeah. is history, man. Yes, this is, you got it all in here. This is history, man. Yeah. Very important yeah. history. And you describe how the Sandy Gully was created. Sandy Gully. Mm -hmm. Sandy Gully. Right. And the Americans made it into a unit, into a military base. And this base came through that, and this was this this base came about the pre, through the predecessor of the land lease program. It's called the Destroyers for Bases Agreement in 1940, it's a which was to last for 99 years. And then this ultimately became the land lease program. Land lease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sandy Gully became, for some, the stepping stone for making connections to migrate to the United States. But for some, it was their ruin. After leaving comfortable jobs for the promise of more, more lucrative gain working with the Americans, when Sandy Gully phased down, they found they had no more jobs left to go back to. Some managed, however, to improve their, their, their lot. Frankie Whitaker. Frankie. <laughs> Frankie Whitaker. A Woolmers graduate, three years older than me, and who was working with my elder brother Herbert in the tax department. 
gave up his Jamaican job and did well with the Americans, never to return to work for the Jamaican government. Frankie's older brother started the Cub Pack in St. Anne's Bay when I was age seven, during which time I became a Cub leader at 14, at which time you became a scout at 14. Those formative scouting years contributed to laying the foundation for my later confidence and adventurism to go to America. Sandy Gully was decommissioned in 1949 and abandoned. Then you go on to describe Jamaica and its history and the Spanish, and I'll give you a little bit of background. Jamaica's human history started around 600 years AD. The inhabitants immediately prior to the Spanish were the Tieno branch of the Arawak Indians from the Orinoco region of South America. Columbus, on his second voyage to the New World, sighted Jamaica on May 4th, 1494, and established a Spanish settlement. The British conquered the Spanish in Jamaica in 1655, and Jamaica became a British colony until its independence on August 6th, 1962. Jamaica received over 300,000 of the estimated 20 million slaves brought across the Atlantic from Africa. Other incomers were Jews, Chinese, Indians, South Asians, English, Scots, Irish, Germans, Middle Easterners. All over the years would have formed a body of one people, of which the country's motto reads today, out of many one people. Jamaica, although predominantly sub-Saharan African descent, is regarded as a well-adjusted community of inter-ethnic shades of color related to one another. With this background, the Jamaican farm worker entering the United States during World War II came with a broad sense of inclusion that was to have a dramatic and lasting impact on the attitudes of those they encountered in the United States. This is information, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't wonder how far this book yeah. will go. Well, then I read you the part about how you were recruited in Brownstown. So we'll go from, we'll go from there. How you went on the train to Trout Hall. You saw the pictures of the Cuba. And now you're leaving. And the David Shanks, we discussed the David, the, the David Shanks. Don't you, Michael, right. God bless yeah. you. Well, I'll give you a little bit more if you're, if you're okay. You now arrive at Elba. And when you get to Elba, you hear the cry, my goodness, is this the place they brought us to? Because it's way out in the nowhere. Elba is in the way in the middle of nowhere. You finally arrive because you get on the train to Batavia and then they take you from Batavia to Elba. They take you on buses to Elba. And you arrive dark at night is when you arrive to Elba. Oh, God. Okay. It was 10 p.m. It wasn't until 10 p.m. that you got to Batavia. There were some old model buses waiting for us. And we climbed in and off on the six-mile journey to our destination to the labor camp in Elba. On leaving the lights of Batavia, it became apparent that we were penetrating a dark, faraway place. <laughs> yeah. As we peered through the windows of the traveling buses into the darkness, I heard cries from the main saying, my God, is this the place they bring us? Adding to the sense of isolation was the camp was not within the residential part of Elba, but as we later learned, three miles out of the town in the hinterlands. Our buses bounced roughly through what was the entrance to the camp. This is Elba farm fields, you're gonna see, and then I'm gonna show you. This is the farmland you worked on. There's more pictures I'll show you. But this is Elba, this is Elba. The, buff, the buses then bounced, came roughly, came to the entrance of the camp to disgorge 300 Jamaican farm workers who were to live in the camp for the next five months. We assembled in the darkness, bewildered. Suitcases, boxes, all around our feet. I peered into the dark, could only see dimly the outline of little cabins dotted over the campgrounds. Out of the dark came a voice. Come this way, gentlemen. 
That was when I saw Slim for the first time. <laughs> Slim! Oh my god, Slim! Mm -hmm. Well over six feet, the boys were to quit. You have to look through a periscope to see his face. Slim, hailing from the parish of St. Mary, was the head cook. He and his Jamaican staff were an advanced complement of men to receive us with a ready meal. He led us to the mess hall where hot chocolate and bread were served. At this time of night, there was, this was sufficient as we were anxious to get to bed. But before we could enjoy the luxury of sleep, however, we had to go to a storehouse to pick up a straw mattress for each of you and blankets, then out into the dark to go find yourself a cabin. Each a cabin, each cabin accommodated four people. Friends stuck together as we searched in the darkness to find suitable cabins. The only visible light came from the mess hall situated in the middle of the campgrounds. Alfred, Ferdy, Lance and I found a cabin on the southern tip of the camp. We quickly made our beds and were fast asleep. We woke next morning to the sound of a bell ringing from the mess hall. This was to become a familiar sound in the days to come. It was dreaded at six o'clock in the morning on cold mornings when we had to go to work, oh but a welcome sound <clears throat> when we returned home and had to eat and wanted to eat. That's the sound of the gong, my boy, said Alfred. If you don't get it now, you won't eat again until dinner. What so, a good thing I like this. It's a good thing, yes. Mm -hmm. Here's the campgrounds that you went to. This is, these are the buildings, these are the administrative buildings when you were at the camp. So this is the entrance to the camp here. And you would go through this entrance and this is where all the, the offices and the, uh, the administration of the camp was. So you would come in here and you drive through into the, into your What cabin. a good thing to have this book with me. Yeah. Elba Labor Camp, as it was called, stretched over a wide area. It was on a gradual slope that ended just where our cabins were. At the entrance of the camp were the manager's office, many hundreds of yards away. Elba at that time consisted of what looked like a small community of people with quiet homes well drawn back from their tree-lined sidewalks and smooth streets where one would see a pub or a shop quietly serving a few customers. Throughout the years, the population has remained stable at about 2,000 people. It was strictly a farming area with miles and miles of arable land. But Little Elba, as we were soon to discover, was one of the largest onion producing areas in the world. What of the world? Of the world, was one of the largest onion producing areas of the world, Elba. And we were there to come to save those crops. So Elba, was known for its onions throughout the world. Then when you said the name Elba, people thought of onions. And the reason why you went to Elba of all places is because all those onions were there and nobody could, nobody could reap them up. So this is your first work day. The next morning, Wednesday, June 7th, 1944, we went to work for the first time. That was your first working in America, yes. To sleep again, yeah. You should have recorded it on the computer. It'll be there. Well, make arrangements, but I'm going to continue going here. So if you want to bring it in, we can't go. We can't move there. You have to stay. You don't have to move. I can bring our computer. Well, then do so and stop chatting and go. You see, all your freshness is being recorded for well, posterity as well.